Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today we're going to talk about buffers. Uh, buffers as they relate to microcontrollers, buffers as they relate to software. Uh, this video is meant to be uh, an extension of the uh, previous videos I did on communication. Now the question is, what is a buffer? The dictionary defines a buffer as something that reduces impact or shock. These definitions are, while they're accurate, they make it difficult to infer what a buffer is when it relates to like a microcontroller. The best analogy I could think of for a buffer is a mailbox. Your mailman every day drops your mail off, uh, let's say between 9 and noon. If you did not have a mailbox, you would have to be home between 9 and noon every single day to receive your mail. And that uh, is stressful because you have to be at work, there's other things you have to do, you can't just be tied to your house every day from 9 to noon to receive your mail. So what the mailbox does is when the mailman shows up, he drops the mail into the mailbox so that uh, when you come home after work, you know, let's say at 5 p.m., uh, you can then open your mailbox and retrieve your mail. The mailbox in this uh, example serves like a buffer. It reduces the shock of having to be at home, uh, you know, between 9 and noon every single day to receive your mail. The mailbox buffers the mail. And uh, I think that's the perfect analogy for how a buffer works. Whenever uh, data arrives, a buffer can hold that data for some amount of time. It can't hold it forever, and we'll talk about that uh, here in a minute. And that gives you your program time to react to uh, the mail arriving, you know, the data arriving, uh, without being overloaded. It doesn't have to, you know, right away uh, deal with that information. It can deal with that information at a slightly later time. A buffer in the microcontroller is uh, sometimes referred to as a ring buffer. And from what, you can, we, that what we can see, I uh, drew here, is you have a ring. Uh, another name for a, a ring buffer is a FIFO, an F-I-F-O. What that stands for, it's an acronym, it stands for first in, first out. What that means is that whenever data arrives into the buffer, the buffer actually remembers uh, the order in which the data arrived. And the buffer, whenever you ask it for data, will retrieve you the oldest data first. So the first data that entered is the first data that leaves the buffer. Some other things, uh, some other uh, definitions that you need to know when talking about buffers are a head and tail. Head and tail are the locations in the buffer where uh, data is being deposited and that's the head and uh, the tail is where the data is being retrieved. So let's use this uh, ring here uh, to work through the operation of a buffer. Something that I would really like to stress is that regardless of whether you have a hardware buffer or a software buffer, the idea of the buffer works exactly in this fashion. When the buffer first starts, it is empty, there's nothing in it, and the head and tail, the head here is represented in red and the tail is represented in blue, are sitting on the same cell. Let's call it a cell, cell just for uh, uh, this example. And uh, the easiest way to uh, imagine this is using uh, UART as an example. A uh, UART uh, packet, I guess even packet's not a great word for it, a byte of UART data comes in. Let's say it's the uh, number 9. The number 9 comes in. When the number 9 comes in, uh, data let me grab a different color for this, so just so it's not confusing. Uh, data is written to the cell of where the uh, head is located. So a 9 is written to the cell. After the 9 is written to the cell, the head is then advanced in the ring. 
the head then moves to the next location. And in this case, we're going counterclockwise. It could go clockwise. You know, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is the shape and how uh, things uh, operate in the buffer. So the 9 came in and now the head moved. So then let's say a 22 rolls in again. And again, the 22 gets written to the cell where the head of the buffer is located. 22, like that. And the head is advanced to the next location, just like that. To speed up the example, so to speak, instead of really doing one at a time, let's do a couple at a time. So then let's say a three, a seven, and an 11 comes in. And you know, following the previous rule that we had, the head then advances all the way up here to the next empty spot. Next, you know, now this data is buffered, you know, 9223711. Next, we want to actually read the data. When we read the data, the data is read out of the tail. And as you can see, the tail is pointing toward uh, the first data that arrived, which is the oldest data in the, you know, the string of characters that we sent. So next we read the nine. When we read the nine, the tail advances to the next location. Something to note is that the nine here does not necessarily get erased when the tail is moved. But the nine can't be read out again because the tail advanced to the next location. Uh, this becomes very important because in this kind of a buffer, if you pull the buffer or read from the buffer, you can only read it once and the data is effectively lost. Even though it still may be sitting in memory, you can no longer retrieve it. Now that we know how a read works, you read the number and you move the uh, tail, uh, we can look at uh, some of the ways uh, a buffer breaks down. So let's say for instance, a bunch more data came in. Let's say uh, a 12, a 14, a 17. And uh, let's just uh, leave it uh, to that spot. So now that we have the 17, the pointer moves to the head, moves to nine. And let me go ahead and erase that like that. And uh, this is the point where we can start running into some issues because when we write one more character to uh, this uh, buffer, uh, the head and the tail end up on top of each other. So let's say the uh, next thing that we write Another piece of data comes in over the UART, and now this is uh, 37. And the head moves from this location to this location. Like that. The buffer is now effectively full. When you go to write one more piece of data to this buffer without doing a read, Technically, the head could jump past the tail. This never actually happens uh, because uh, that would violate how uh, the buffer works. But uh, let's say in hardware, if you have a hardware buffer, uh, writing one more piece of data to this buffer will trigger something called an overflow. The buffer, because the buffer is full, think of it like a cup being full. You try to put a little more in the cup and the cup overflows and that's exactly what happens. In hardware, whenever a buffer overflows, usually uh, the uh, uh, module inside the microcontroller will give you an error. And uh, that's an error you have to clear, but sometimes you don't, etc. But the next thing uh, is that the buffer actually stops taking in data. That, uh, you know, let's say we write another number to it, you trigger an overflow, and that's it. The head and the tail are frozen. Uh, right where they are. Now to compare and contrast this to a software buffer, in a software buffer you actually have a choice. You can either behave just like the hardware buffer does, where uh, the new incoming data to a fully uh, loaded buffer is rejected, 
or uh, you can actually, uh, let's say, prefer the new data over the old data. So let's say the next number that comes in is a one. What happens in that case is you delete the, the number that was stored in there, you store a one, but in this case, both the head and the tail move at the same time. In this case, effectively, the head is pushing the tail along. This kind of behavior uh, effectively uh, stores the newest data. It favors, that's the word I'm looking for, it favors the newer data as the data comes in at the expense of erasing the older data. A great way to visualize how a buffer works, but in reality there's nothing actually that uh, links, you know, in a circle like this. So let's take a look how this buffer actually looks and we'll talk just slightly about how a buffer like this codes, mostly because there's lots of ways to skin a cat. There's lots of ways to code this, so you know, I'm not going to pigeonhole you into, oh, this is the only way to do it. There's nothing else you can do, you know, absolutely not. There's a lots of way to do this. We're just gonna talk about the general hypothetical of uh, how you actually uh, you know, represent in real life, a buffer is represented as an array. And you can use an array inside of a struct or just the array by itself, kind of as a naked container. Uh, you can use this stuff in classes. There's all kinds of different little ways of doing it. So in the array, you have a head and a tail. But, you know, how do you actually have a head and a tail in real life? Well, the way you do it is you have variables which keep track of your head and your tail and they use the indexes of the array as the variable they store. So in a fresh array you have your tail which is stored at index 0 and you have your head which is also stored in index 0. The function is called that uh, brings data into the buffer here. Uh, the function has to do several things. The first thing the function has to do is check to see is there actually room available in the buffer. There's a couple of different ways of doing this. You can uh, take the difference between head and tail or tail and head depending on which one's larger and you know compare that to how many spaces are in the buffer etc. But to me, personally, that's a messy way of doing it. My favorite way of dealing with a buffer like this is to use another variable called count. When the buffer is empty, you set count equals to zero. Now, the function that uh, we called, uh, you know, came in, checked, saw that count is less than five, which is the size of our buffer, and that tells uh, our function that, okay, we can go ahead and accept data. So let's say we bring in the number five. The number five is written to the array, and then several things get updated. The head has to get moved up one, and in reality, the way this actually happens is the uh, index of where our head is is incremented one to go to one. Also, because now a piece of data is stored in our array, the uh, count here is also incremented to one. Now that we have a basic of an understanding of how data comes in, let's uh, speed the process up a little bit. Let's say, you know, uh, another was a one, two, three bits of data come in. So the, uh, you know, uh, a seven, a two, uh, and a 12 come in. So each time each one of these uh, pieces of data come in, the head gets incremented one and count gets incremented one. Since one, two, three uh, more pieces of data came in, uh, this, uh, both the head and the count, both go up by three. 
So now uh, this becomes a four and this also becomes a four and our head is now sitting right here. When we get to this point, things get a little tricky. The first thing is because we're using arrays, arrays always start at an index zero, which uh, make things just a little more difficult to work with. Because let's say our next bit of data comes in, you know, a, a three, the uh, head has to get incremented one, but we don't have anything here. So uh, inside the uh, part of the function that does the incrementing, you have to have a check. And that check has to uh, look for, well, what is the uh, size of our array and uh, where is the head located? So once we get to four, we have to, uh, so to speak, modulo increment uh, from here on out. So first we uh, increment to five. And again, as I mentioned, five doesn't exist. Five is the size of our array. And we know that once we hit five, we have to wrap it back around. And now we bring it back over here to uh, zero. So four goes to five and then back to zero, just like that. Let me erase that. And also uh, our array now increments from four to five, which uh, next time data would be written into uh, this function, I'm sorry, into the buffer, uh, the five would let the function know that the array is full, that the buffer is full. Previously, if more data is written into uh, this buffer, again, you have to make a choice whether you want the head to push the tail and the count will stay the same, but now the head and tail increment at the same time instead of just the head incrementing. Or, uh, you know, the count still stays at five, but uh, you don't increment either the head or the tail and just uh, discard the data. Let's talk about what happens when a uh, data is read out of uh, the buffer. Our tail here is sitting on the number five here. So when we uh, go to read the buffer, the, num uh, the, uh, the buffer function, the, the function that gets the data out of the buffer will return you where the uh, tail is located. But even before it does that, first it has to check count to see that count is greater than zero. If count is greater than zero, then there is actually data sitting in the buffer and it lets you return that data. So, you know, in our example here, we want to read the data, we check the count. Okay, count is greater than zero. Now we go ahead and return, you know, we store the five. Let's go with that. We store the five. Then we move the tail. So the tail goes from a zero to a one. And we decrement the count because we read out one of the stored pieces of data here like that and that's it the thing to remember is once the tail gets all the way to the end here you have to do that same kind of modulo increment that if the tail gets to five in our case uh, the function knows to wrap the tail back around but uh, once uh, the tail and the count are incremented. Now we take the value five that was stored previously and go ahead and return it, which uh, exits out of the function. We've talked about the function that puts data into the buffer, and we've talked about the function that gets data out of the buffer. There's one more function I'd like to talk about, and that function is commonly referred to as peak. Peak is very similar into the get data out of the buffer function. The difference being is that peak retrieves the data out of the buffer without uh, effectively erasing it, without uh, incrementing the tail and decrementing the count. The reason for this is sometimes you need to you know, take a quick look at the data 
to see what it is before you, you know, you use it and lose it, so to speak. This has been a basic introduction to buffers. Uh, we talked about uh, what a ring buffer looks like and uh, what the acronym FIFO, F-I-F-O stands for, for uh, first in, first out. Uh, we looked at how the head and tail move around uh, the circle of the ring buffer. And then we rolled that over into a more practical situation where you have an array and how you actually keep track of where the head and the tail are in the array uh, by using variables, head, tail, and count to store uh, the different uh, variables. Thank you for watching. Uh, of course, if you have any questions or comments, you're uh, welcome to put them down below. And always don't forget to give me a big old thumbs up.